Okay, um, first lecture, uh, podcast lecture for you. Um, I said I'd talk a little more about colonialism, uh, give you a few more details um, about that. Uh, so here goes. Uh, I'm going to start, as I did in the, in the lecture, with uh, the Berlin Treaty, 1884-1885. I spoke a bit about that in terms of the fact that it was an entirely European affair that was supposed to resolve a series of rivalries between European countries. Um, it didn't resolve them fully. It's worth bearing in mind that not everything was set um, by the end of the conference. The rules of uh, occupation of Africa had been established and some um, possessions have been sort of formalised. I mentioned the uh, Congo Free State, for example, King Leopold II's um, almost personal fiefdom. But a lot of other parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa remained uh, contested and treaties were drawn up between 1884 and uh, the 1920s. That, that period was, was a period in which all of the nation states' boundaries pretty much were settled. So that's a period in which we can define colonialism, 1884 to 1920, as, as, as principally characterised by um, issues of conquest and occupation. This was a, a, an especially um, violent and disruptive and turbulent time for African people, um, a time of, of, of war and occupation, to put it bluntly. Up until then, there had been a whole series of encounters between European forces of one kind or another who wished to try and claim land, um, particularly on the uh, west coast of Africa, where there were all these stories of great wealth in land and great uh, trading opportunities. But by and large, those attempts at occupation had been, uh, at best from a European point of view, um, partially successful. African military forces, often involving the kind of gathering together of local militias from different villages, were the equal of many European um, military expeditions. But in the late 1800s, when this idea of effective occupation became so important, things changed. Um, and most particularly they changed because uh, Europeans came with better rifles. And also, in the late 1800s, uh, the Gatling gun was invented. Uh, the, the, there was an, there's an immense change in the v dynamics of violence once the Gatling gun is used as part of the machinery of conquest because it allowed people to fire multiple rounds simultaneously rather than reloading uh, single rifles. The Gatling gun is a horrific piece of technology when seen in its historical context and it allowed European forces to shower African uh, troops, African militias who were armed with must often just single bore musket rifles um, and, and gun them down and, and some of the uh, accounts of those encounters very kind of barely state you know that, that it was it, it, massacres took place massacres that were exemplary for other uh, people who were thinking of rebelling and, and massacres that, that effectively neutralised bare military resistance. But resistance continued. African societies, African groups continued to rebel against colonialism for the self-evident reason that it was an external intervention, an external imposition. I think a lot of the time when you read stuff about colonialism, it's based on this, this idea of, of European invasion and European uh, occupation and European power. But of course, in all of those moments, there are moments of agency and resistance. We cannot ever forget that. Uh, and I can give you four very briefly examples of that. There are, there are many, many of them in the, in the literature, but these are four that maybe stand out particularly. Uh, the Sierra Leone hot tax rebellion, uh, of 1898. Um, I mentioned in the lecture about the unpopularity of, of, of the hut tax or, or, or poll tax based on the head of household. Um, those taxes incidentally could be extremely high. They could, they, could, they could 
be the equivalent of two months' work uh, in terms of cash economy. So they weren't they weren't tri trivial marginal raisings of ref revenue. They were for poor people, uh, for peasant farmers, immense demands, and there were a whole series of rebellions against tax offices could take different forms. And Sierra Leone hut tax is a good example of that. Uh, the Margi Margi rebellion in in what's now Tanzania was was a, a series of raids and 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 open conflicts against the German occupying forces that lasted for over two years and led to uh, the German military chasing rebels around uh, the central areas um, of Tanzania. Margi Margi is key Swahili for water and it uh, it's something that actually still remains in various conflicts around uh, Central Africa, uh, the use of uh, ideas of invulnerability to bullets, um, the bullets turning to water, and the military effectiveness of the fearlessness that that, that gave uh, fighting units. Another very famous one is the Zulu Rebellion, the Bambata Rebellion in, in South Africa, what's now South Africa in 1906, and a whole series of defeats of the, of, of, of the Dutch and, and British invading forces. Um, and, and finally, the, the Women's War of 1929, in which women who, who often are very active and prominent traders in West African markets um, found that the disenfranchisement of their economic activity by the colonial government uh, led them to beat up uh, market officials, t tear down the doors and um, architecture of, of, of official buildings. So a diverse set of reasons for rebellion, but rebellion right through this period from late 1800s to 1920. But by 1920, most of Africa had been, as I, as, as I said, occupied effectively in that colonial sense of having boundaries, of having established a kind of violent peace and a series of rudimentary systems of governance often focused around what one might call bare state power, not, not, not anything that relates to legitimacy, um, legitimate rule, not anything that relates certainly to institutions of representation. But within this context, it, it's important to recognise also that for many Africans, the facts on the ground of colonialism um, created a whole series of, of strategies, of, if you like, accommodation. Um, if you have a large overwhelming external force and rebellion becomes increasingly historically difficult to pursue successfully, what are your, what are your next options? Uh, so from the 1920s onwards there emerges a, a whole series of, if you like, cadres of people who seek the advantages that the colonial system might offer, slender though they might be. Uh, in the 1920s onwards you find a, a group of Africans who become as I mentioned in the in, in lecture, uh, the local representatives of the state, uh, the, the the mechanism that I that I well, it's not my phrase; it's a phrase that's used very commonly. It was uh, Frederick Lugard who 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 used it first. A, a indirect indirect rule, ruling through so-called chiefs at the local level. The the British colonial experience, particularly, was defined by indirect rule, and it created a group of chiefs who um, became the local face of the state, who, who, who carried out the law of the colonial state, who raised the militias to gather the tax and who imposed the punishments upon people who didn't pay their tax um, and to keep everyone in line in some fashion or, or another, maybe to restrict people's uh, movements as well. Um, beyond the chiefs at the local level, uh, also a, a group of uh, primary school educated, maybe secondary school educated, very often missionaries, missionary uh, school educated officials emerged at the lower levels of what one might call, properly speaking, the bureaucracy in, in regional towns uh, and, and cities. These people were different from the chiefs in that they didn't have a kind of kin or lineage-based source of authority, and they tended to be more thoroughly integrated in, into the colonial state. Beyond those, if you like, political appointees, many Africans actually found, for certain times and in certain contexts, political opportunities in the colonial project. 
in West Africa, um, the, the political economy of colonization was based around a certain kind of acceptance of peasant farming. Um, there was no great settlement wave in West Africa, no strong ingress of Europeans into West Africa. So uh, peasants would seek out new crops that had been imported, particularly cocoa, um, and try and find ways of, of producing them and making money from them. And indeed, a, a, a quite large number of, of small-scale farmers over certain periods, depending on the time and the, and the nature of the global market. But in the 1920s, when a lot of primary commodity prices were buoyant, people made a, a considerable amount of money out of, uh, out of cocoa. And the emergence of regional feeder roads into market towns uh, also promoted that. Furthermore, pe uh, peasants began to become more likely to move, move into new areas to clear new forest and to assert um, property rights over new pieces of, of, of land. So there were opportunities there. Um, if, you ca if you could take advantage of these new cash crops, uh, you, you, you could find a, uh, the beginnings of, of a, a project of social improvement even within the immensely constraining frameworks of colonialism. In East Africa, and certainly in Southern Africa, settlement was far more important. Um, South Africa had been settled since the uh, early 1600s by the Dutch, and there's a separate story to that we could pursue at another time if, if you wish. But obviously, most clearly in, in Kenya, but also in Mozambique and Tanzania, uh, in, in, in Zimbabwe, uh, and in Zambia, actually, um, groups of settlers uh, occupied uh, fertile land, um, well rain fed land, land that was generally in relatively uh, temperate places. Uh, sort of, I think in Kenya, around 300,000 settlers in all. The largest settler uh, experience was in Algeria, which we don't cover, and that was close to a million uh, uh, French uh, people. But, but fairly substantial numbers of people, certainly hundreds of thousands, alienating land from others and setting up um, plantation economies, upon which then people worked, in some circumstances worked to their own advantage, but by and large, it, the, the experience of settlement was, was an entirely awful one for, for African farmers in one fashion uh, or another. So we move then in the from the 1920s onwards to something that's far more obviously a kind of uh, capitalist colonialism. This is the period in which uh, countries become purposed to export a small number of goods, more or less unprocessed, that then get fed into the consumer markets of developed European economies or as raw materials into, uh, into uh, European industries, palm oil, uh, sisal, uh, into European industries, copper of course, diamonds, some other metals, uh, and the, the obvious ones we're all so familiar with, uh, sugar, coffee and tea, oh and cotton I should mention as well. All of these things fed into European economies. They made all of the uh, African colonial economies, if you like, kind of components to, uh, to another, another strategy of accumulation. That's very clear in the statistics of import and export. Uh, that was what was going on. That was very explicitly what the project was about. Um, the French colonial experience had a phrase, again, in a historical sense, a, a, a very honest phrase for that, which was uh, useful and unuseful Africa. The French particularly had a worry that the, a lot of the places they colonised were of no economic use whatsoever. Large areas of the Sahel were colonised by the French. The idea of useful and unuseful Africa was, was, was a kind of overarching, I suppose, uh, focus of colonialism to find those areas that would be of use um, for the European economy. At the same time as this was happening, by and large, more money was going into the colonies as was coming out, but that doesn't tell you much. It's more about the use of the, the, the economy for uh, Western states and also the effects of that on African economies. Who, the, were diverse before colonialism and even uh, after the effects of slavery were diverse and were dynamic and were flexible even if they weren't highly productive and highly uh, 
technologically sophisticated. So colonialism created a system of migration, uh, labour migration onto, into mines and onto plantations, and it created a series of specialisms. Moving on from the 1920s uh, to the 1940s and, and the Second World War, the Second World War is a really important marker in the colonial experience for all sorts of reasons. The first one, um, and this is a kind of ethnocentric message again, is that Africans were fully integrated into the war itself. Uh, 375,000 uh, Africans directly participated in the Second World War as troops and of, and of services to mobile troop contingents. So over a third of a million Africans were directly related to that uh, war itself, directly war front, you know, organised into military forces. Secondly, uh, an uncounted number of Africans were coercively or through authoritarian order repurposed to, to, to feed the war machines of Europe, particularly the, the, the Allies. People producing uh, increasing amounts of crops, people producing increasing amounts of more raw materials and increasing amounts uh, of food that all fed into the, uh, into the colonial political economies of war. The ex and after the war, I should mention, after the war, the, the, the economies of the colonies became a kind of source of, of reparations, not, not martial aid but, or anything like on the scale of martial aid, but significant amounts of, significant amounts of uh, money. Uh, in the UK from 1945 to 1951, the colonies repaid back into the British Exchequer £140 million pounds in the... Uh, think about that 140 million, I haven't done the calculations, but in real terms now that would obviously be a lot more. One of the effects of the, the war, the after effects of the war, is that it radicalised and mobilised a, a whole new group of Africans who had often been through primary schooling and then, then had entered into wartime experiences and then returned home having talked to European troops, many of whom at the time held socialist or nationalist beliefs about freedom and self-determination and they return to, a, to an unchanged, in, in their view I think, and some somewhat unchanged home, a place that seemed almost to go against all of the, the values that the Allies were fighting for in, in Europe. The idea of self-determination, the idea of struggling, you know, armed struggling against a tyranny and then going back to, a, to, to, to countries where Europeans in pith helmets with feathers sticking out would parade around and, and claim to be ruling um, savages, effectively. It just, it just became a culturally and politically increasingly uh, combative kind of a, 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 a political relationship. Africans had seen that Europeans could cry, could be killed, could be sitting down peeling potatoes, could be tired, could be lonely. It also took off the veneer that uh, Europeans were um, in some fashion invulnerable. This, this image that Europeans had created for themselves was being in some fashion different, um, more powerful representatives of a project that seemed unstoppable. All of that started to melt through the experiences of the Second World War. So post-war, post-Second World War, African nationalism just grows and grows throughout the 1950s and into the 60s and, uh, and then into independence. Uh, the colonial experience is, is, after the Second World War, really one of gradual European realisation that they no longer can control these colonies. There are a whole series of discussions in Br the British Parliament about that, and in retrospect they look a little bit uh, like self-deceit. Um, and the dynamics of anti-colonialism become immensely important. Uh, individuals, and you can Google these people and find out about them, each of them has a remarkable and interesting story. Uh, I choose them because they represent different kinds of decolonization in some ways. Uh, Felix Houfwe Boigny of, of the Ivory Coast, who was a member of the Assembly of the Republic in, in France, was actually a, a parliamentarian in France, uh, and, and if you like, uh, foregrounded the, the, the winning of independence for the Ivory Coast. Namdi Azikiwe in, in Nigeria. You could have chosen all sorts of different individuals in Nigeria, but 
as Ikiwe was actually, I think, the first person to set up a, a, an African party of decolonization, pro-independence party. Others followed very quickly. Julius Nyereri of Tanzania, uh, who, who uh, led a, a struggle for independence in, in Tanzania. Um, or each of these has interesting stories to tell. They, they bounce off of, 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 of similar kinds of experiences, experiences of being in Europe, experiences of managing the, the, the kinds of, of, of feelings after the Second World War, Ex the, the experience of being part of a small but growing and, um, and politically ambitious uh, political elite. Each of those each of those leaders made different decisions about how to relate to traditional chiefs, so called, or to other emerging political forces. Political unions, labour unions emerged in the nineteen forties in sub Saharan Africa. Um, different civil society organizations, newspapers, for the first time African newspapers written by Africans for Africans to try and encapsulate the spirit of a new sense of self determination. So I'll stop there for now. Um, let me know how you think this has gone. Um, I'm happy to do more of these. Um, but that, that gives you some more detail on, on colonialism. If, if you're interested in more stuff, there's plenty of great books one can start with to look at uh, these things. Um, perhaps, yeah, well, perhaps I'll send you some readings if you wish. But otherwise, that will uh, do it. So.